Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you today uh, to this uh, event, Irish Women in Leadership in Peace, Security and Diplomacy. Um, in this panel discussion, which is jointly organized by the Embassy of Ireland to Belgium, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the IIEA, we're delighted to be joined by a panel of three distinguished Irish women, Brigadier General Maureen O'Brien, Secretary General of the Department of Defence, Jackie McCrum, and the Political Director of the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Sonia Highland. Um, they will highlight their experiences in senior leadership roles and offer perspectives on how the application uh, of, these, uh, of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda can enhance foreign security and defence policy. Two, 2020 marks the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council resolution on women, peace and security, and is also the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action in this regard. So to celebrate these milestones, the panel will discuss how the meaningful participation of women at the decision-making table can shape better policy and operational decisions. This event is part of the Irish Embassy's Visible Women 2020 initiative, which aims at amplifying the um, women's voice and role in diplomacy, development, entrepreneurship and the arts. And the Embassy in Belgium has organised uh, a significant agenda uh, in, this, in this area. Um, Following the opening remarks um, uh, by Ambassador Helena Nolan, whom I hope will be able to join us um, and from the Embassy of Ireland to Belgium, we will pass the floor to our three distinguished speakers who will each speak for approximately 10 minutes and then we will transition to question and answer with our audience. Um, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. So please feel free to send your questions in uh, during these sessions as they occur to you. And we will come to them uh, once the panel have finished their remarks. Uh, we would appreciate uh, if you could indicate your name and affiliation uh, when you put, put your question. And um, I'm happy to say that today's presentation and the question and answer are both on the record. So please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter, also using the handle at IIEA and hashtag VisibleWoman2020. So uh, I will now formally introduce Ambassador Helena Nolan and hand over her to uh, give you the background to the discussion. Helena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Murray. We've had a few technical difficulties, so can I just check if you can see and hear me? Yes, yes, we can. We can, and I hope our audience can too. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much, Mary. It's lovely to see you uh, and our panelists and welcome everyone to this event today. Uh, the Embassy of Ireland in Belgium and our Partnership for Peace delegation are really pleased to be partnering with the IIEA to host this event on women in leadership. And we're delighted that so many participants have, uh, have signed up joining us from Ireland, Belgium and all over the world. One of the benefits, I suppose, of taking events like these online these days. I want to thank everyone who made this possible, including your team at the IIEA and especially Clodagh Quayne, whom we know well from her time here in Brussels, and my own colleagues, Elaine Hollowood, Tony Ormsby, and Maruna Buras. And Maruna is an active member of Women in International Security here in Brussels, so a special welcome to all of the wise women who are attending this event and to all of our really good colleagues and partners here in Belgium. Work on gender inclusivity is a horizontal priority for Ireland, as you know, across all of our policies and operations. It's the key element in our approach to our UN Security Council tenure, which will commence in January. It's a priority for our embassy here, for our partnership at NATO, for our defence forces, our peacekeepers, and it's a priority for me personally and one in which I've been proud to work on in my career, including in my most recent uh, former role as disarmament director. Ireland has really led in bringing a gender perspective to all aspects of disarmament with the focus both on the gendered impact of weapons and on the need for greater female empowerment in disarmament fora. And this has been a real game changer with innovative results, especially in the area of nuclear disarmament. This year, we all know is a very important anniversary year marking 20 years of 1325 and the Beijing conference, which preceded it. And it's really great, I think, that we're continuing the conversations and the learnings 
from so many excellent WPS events which have already happened this year. We're taking that conversation on into November and hopefully beyond. And as I'm sure we'll come to in our discussions, it's really important that this conversation and this focus continues beyond one day or one month. Here at the embassy, to give you some background, we've taken the opportunity of this anniversary year to have a thematic approach to all of our work, which we called Visible Women 2020. And we've chosen to use the whole year to focus on female role models and to amplify the voices and celebrate the contributions of women. Just last week, we helped to launch an important new guide on gender inclusivity in peace and security with really useful advice and best practice examples on how to implement 1325 including on overcoming resistance because implementation is always the most challenging part and you can find more details uh, of the guide and a link to watch the event back on our twitter account the harrowing experience of covid this year has really served to further highlight the risks around persistent inequalities and the need for a gender perspective and an inclusive response so i think our dialogue here today is even more timely and necessary now at some point, and that day is coming, I'm sure we'll no longer be talking about the first woman to do X or Y because this will no longer be an issue uh, or notable. But for as long as we have these firsts, then I do believe it's important we pay attention to them and we celebrate them as achievements, as role models to enhance our awareness and our learning. And here in my host country, Belgium, for example, we currently have for the first time women recently appointed in the new government in the roles of Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Defence, uh, and also the acting head of the Foreign Ministry at present. All very positive and impressive signals of diversity and inclusivity, which is so important for decision-making and our work. Uh, so to conclude then, we could hardly do better in terms of role models from Ireland on diplomacy, peace and security than the great panel of women leaders we have here today each of whom are trailblazers in their own careers and as senior leaders in their organizations. And I'd include you in this, Maria, as our former ambassador to the uh, Political and Security Committee, as well as much earlier in your career, uh, blazing a trail as a young diplomat when you're a member of the bilateral embassy here, when it was actually the first ever all-female embassy in the Irish diplomatic network. I was very proud to follow in the footsteps of our first woman ambassador here, Mary Tinney, your colleague, uh, almost 40 years later, and we decided to make Ambassador Tinney's achievement more visible here too, by putting some photographs up around the walls and naming our conference room in her honour. And if participants would like to learn more about the history of Irish women in diplomacy, I can recommend a brand new publication by Dr. Anne-Marie O'Brien entitled The Ideal Diplomat. And I'm deliberately removing the question mark that was uh, in the original title. Uh, and we'll also be bringing out a special Visible Women newsletter from the Embassy in December, reviewing all of our work on this agenda this year. So I'm especially pleased today that we're going to hear from three senior leaders from the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Department of Defence and from the Irish Defence Forces given the importance of these three sets of relationships and the synergies between them, including here in our Partnership for Peace delegation, where we have a very strong focus on the WPS agenda. And given that we now as departments share the same minister for both foreign affairs and for defense for the first time in our history. So I'm delighted to have been able to work with you and our friends in the IIA to bring together this initiative. Honored to be sharing the platform with these expert speakers. I'm really looking forward to hearing from them and to the conversation. So I'll hand back to you now, Murray, to introduce the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Helena, and uh, congratulations to you and the staff and the embassy in Brussels for, uh, for the very extensive agenda uh, that you have set up for this year. So now I'll move to introduce our panelists. And uh, if I could move to Brigadier General Maureen O'Brien, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Brigadier General O'Brien as the most senior woman serving in the Irish Defence Forces and the first Irish woman to achieve the rank of Brigadier General. She is the Deputy Force Commander of the UN Disengagement Observer Force in the Golan Heights and has extensive overseas uh, experience in Lebanon, Western Sahara, East, East Timor, Chad and Sarajevo. And she's coming to us uh, this afternoon from the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. You're most welcome, uh, Brigadier General O'Brien, and um, uh, 
Um, thank you, Barry, and um, thank you, everybody, Ambassador Nolan and distinguished panelists and ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I am speaking to you today, to you today from Camp War on the Golan in Syria, where I'm serving as the Deputy Force Commander of UNDOF. And UNDOF, as Mary explained, is the United Nations Disengagement Observer Force. This was established by UN Resolution 350 in 1974 following the Arab-Israeli War and is mandated to maintain a ceasefire between Israel and Syria. We do this by observation from our 15 UN posts and by patrolling and reporting as well as conducting dialogue with both parties to the agreement. This afternoon, I want to briefly tell you a little bit about my career in the Defence Forces, and I'll then discuss the impact of UN Resolution 1325 on the UNDOF mission as I see it. And then after that, reflect on the experiences that I have had as a senior leader. I joined the Defence Forces in 1981 um, into an integrated class of both male and female cadets. The fact that we trained alongside our male colleagues and that within a few years, all corps and appointments were open to females is highly significant and a point I will return to later. I've held many command and staff appointments throughout my 39 year service. On being promoted to Leffen Curl, I became the first officer, a uh, female officer to be appointed as a battalion commander when I was appointed to the 27th battalion in Dundalk and Gormanston. As a colonel, I was uh, appointed as the Director of Communications and Information Technology Branch responsible for strategic and tactical communications and information systems, including cyber. As Mary mentioned, I have extensive series uh, overseas experience. Um, I was in Lebanon three times with the, the UNIFIL mission. Um, sorry, the power just gone, so it will come back on. The problem with living in, in the camp. Um, and I was in Minerso in Western Sahara as a military observer. I was in Ontate in East Timor, or now Timor-Leste. And in Minerkat um, in Chad, I was the battalion, the deputy battalion commander. And I was also seconded to the Organization of Security Cooperation in Europe, that's the OSCE, in Sarajevo and Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, for 18 months, where I worked in the area of defense reform. Since September 2019, back on again. Since the September 2019, I have been deployed in the rank of Brigadier General, Commander of UNDAF. One month after leaving in, in October 19, I took over as Acting Force Commander and remained at that appointment until the end of July this year. As we know, UN Resolution 1325, Women, Peace and Security, is generally regarded as the most important commitment made by the global community to incorporate a gender perspective in the maintenance of peace and security. It calls on the Security Council, the UN Secretary General and UN Member States and other parties to take action in four interrelated areas. Of particular significance to me as a member of the Defence Forces is the area of participation of women in decision-making process and also increasing the number of women in field operations. Apart from this being a straightforward equality issue, the UN recognises that with better gender awareness and the presence of females in field missions, the result will be better access to communication with local population, with the international organisations, the government organisations and the non-government organisations. There would be improved operational effectiveness and enhanced overall security and situational awareness. There will be better advice to the commander from which she can make better founded judicious and balanced decisions, all leading to a safe and secure environment. As the special advisor to the Secretary General said, when women's inclusion and gender equality while, gender, while women's inclusion and gender equality may not be a guarantee against conflict and other development, their absent, absence virtually ensures it. Simply put, if you ignore the views and perspectives of over half the world's population, you cannot have equality or lasting peace. In UNDAF, um, women make up 6.5% of, of the military component. Um, I have nine different nationalities uh, represented in the mission. And I'm very pleased to say that the Irish contingent has the largest representation of women at 10.3%. This includes platoon commanders, platoon sergeants, MOAG APC drivers, gunners and technicians. This is where the integrated training I mentioned before has value. 
Irish female personnel are not confined to support roles as females in most other armed forces have been up to quite recently. Indeed, the main reason for the overall low number of female personnel in UNDAF is that the force is largely composed of combat related capabilities. For some troop contributing countries, these positions are only available to men and are women who have just joined the, their forces. Most of the other females in UNDAF are employed as medical personnel, translators, and as staff officers in force headquarters. When it comes to the increasing the numbers of female personnel in field missions, I do have some concerns about initiatives being proposed by the UN. When you review the literature surrounding UN Resolution 1325, it's clear that it almost entirely focuses on women as different from men, both in terms of their particular vulnerabilities um, they face in situations of armed conflict and in terms of their potential contribution to peacekeeping efforts. It espouses an essentialist approach to gender. That is, all the women, all women have a specific set of characteristics and consequently all men have a different set of characteristics. The problem with this essentialist approach is that it can be characterized by exaggerated claims of the unchanging essence of an individual. But if we want to bring peace out of conflict, we are depending on people being able to change. The reality is that people do change and are not one dimensional. Women and men are far more complex and far more interesting than that. I believe that the essentialist approach to gender and the, and the celebration of women's difference to men can unfortunately be used to stereotype female peacekeepers and potentially discriminate. Uh, an example will demonstrate my point. A new initiative um, from the UN, which is supposed to come into effect in 2021, is the requirement for each battalion to have an engagement platoon. This engagement platoon is designed to improve the engagement of the military unit with the local population. Nothing wrong with that so far. Um, the draft document suggests that the participation of female peacekeepers is an essential factor for the successful engagement with the local population. The platoon must consist of at least 50 women. 50% women. I have two problems with this initiative. There is an assumption that all female personnel, even without the appropriate training, are suited to this engagement role simply because they are women. This is the essentialist pro approach again. Secondly, given the low number of females in overseas operations, in order to comply with this requirement, female personnel may be diverted from other important roles which they have been trained for. This approach, however, when will well suit the troop contributing countries where female personnel are still restricted to certain non-combatant roles. However, I personally do not believe this initiative will be successful in the Irish Defence Forces, given the range of highly specialised roles being con conducted by our female personnel at this time. Of course, just increasing the numbers alone will not ensure equality. The result of adding women and stirring can be mainly cosmetic. UN Resolution 1325 requires us to gender and mainstream our policies and our plans, that is, to consider the implications of any planned action on men and women, boys and girls. It's imperative that the processes and policies are inclusive. Those who create policy must hear about the specific experiences of women and men, because according to how we perceive women and men as different, we behave, think and design policies that reflect this point of view. The Defence Force Female Personnel Network has helped in bringing a female voice to the policymakers in the Defence Forces. For example, the network identified a lack of family friendly appointments in overseas missions in particular ranks. These family friendly appointments allow personnel to be deployed for three months rather than six months. But it is when female personnel take up senior leadership roles that there is progress towards inequality of a voice and therefore an ability to contribute and to influence. In my leadership role as acting force commander, I feel I have been most able to add my voice and to influence. As acting force commander, I was responsible for ensuring the implementation of the mandate. Whereas the ceasefire between Israel and Syria has generally been maintained. This does not mean that both parties do not on occasion violate the ceasefire agreement. Violations could range from um, the presence of shepherds on the wrong side of the ceasefire line to missile attacks within the area of responsibility. All violations are protested to the party concerned and reported to the UN headquarters, 
But when there are more serious violations, including missile attacks, I meet face to face with the relevant senior military leadership to call on them to exercise restraint and avoid any further activities that might lead to an escalation between the parties or indeed regionally. These can be very tense occasions, but by continuing to report what we observe with consistency and with accuracy, I believe that both parties accept that they can rely on UNDAF to report with impartiality. Of course, UNDAF has also had to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. In early March, I set up a COVID-19 crisis management group and took a collaborative approach to, this meeting, to these meetings. By including every member's perspective, I could ensure buy-in from the different contingents. In the end, however, I was the one who had to make the unpopular decisions to restrict people's freedoms. UNDAF is currently implementing a detailed action plan designed to maintain operational capability and limit the potential for the spread of the virus within the mission. When I reflect on my experiences with the UN and most recently with UNDAF, I ask myself, have I made a difference? Even though this mission has limited access to the civilian population, there are still very positively disposed to our presence and we are greeted by waving children when we patrol through the area of responsibility. I have ensured that all UNDAF personnel are safe and secure and have appropriate force protection and there have been no cases of COVID-19 thus far, while still implementing our mandate. Have I made a difference because I'm a woman? I don't have any strong opinions on that. I know that who I am is a result of my values and my work ethic instilled in me by my parents, which are complemented by the values of the Defence Forces and those of the United Nations. The opportunities and experiences provided to me by the Defence Forces and by the United Nations have made me the leader I am today. It has not always been easy, but it has been very worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Brigadier General O'Brien. That was a fascinating outline, uh, both of your work and from your personal point of view. So now may I call upon uh, Secretary General uh, Jackie McCrum just to introduce uh, the Secretary General. She is the first woman to lead the Department of Defense as Secretary General. Previously, she was Deputy Secretary General in the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection, uh, Director General and Accounting Officer in the Office of Ombudsman and quite a number of other um, uh, offices of state uh, where she worked and indeed led. So um, the floor is yours, Secretary General. We look forward to hearing you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Mary and Ambassador Nolan for inviting me to join in this occasion. And hello also to my fellow panelists, uh, Maureen and Sonia. Um, I'd like to deal with some policy first and then some personal reflections on my own journey to this position. Ireland is a strong supporter of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. This agenda recognizes both the particularly adverse effect of conflict on women and girls as well as their critical role in conflict prevention, peace negotiations, peace building and governance. In June last year, Ireland launched its third national action plan for United States Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, which among other issues identified the promotion of women in peace mediation and negotiations as a priority. Two years ago, we marked the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, the hallmark of the peace process in Northern Ireland, and one in which women played a key role in bringing around about sustainable peace. From Ireland's perspective, with our long and well-respected history of participating in peacekeeping missions, we believe that the integration of a gender perspective to achieve gender equality and improve gender balance are not only a matter of principle or policy, but a matter of operational necessity and effectiveness. It is recognized that the presence of women contributes greatly with resolving conflict and connecting with local populations. It broadens the skill sets available within a peacekeeping mission and importantly provides role models for women both at home and abroad. Equitable, durable and sustainable peace and reconciliation cannot be built without women at the table. Women's meaningful participation at all levels is the key to sustainable peace and Maureen very eloquently covered this point in her, in her address. Unfortunately, as the global security landscape has developed over the last number of years, it has regrettably not developed for the better. Women and children continue to be deliberately targeted and their rights to life, to physical integrity, to protection in displacement continue to be grossly violated. 
So we need to continue to develop and reinforce our actions. The Defence Force's own Women, Peace and Security Action Plan has commitment to the comprehensive training of peacekeepers on the gendered impacts of conflict and increasing the participation of women in peacekeeping missions. Each overseas deployed unit has a gender focal unit and there is continued training of personnel selected for overseas deployments in order to incorporate a gender perspective into the planning and execution of overseas operations. In terms of participation, a key strategic objective of the defence organisation is the examination of women's participation at senior decision making and leadership levels. Since the first Defence Forces Action Plan in 2011, the percentage of females in middle management and senior ranks has increased from 1.75 to just under 5%. The number of female personnel deployed in overseas operations has increased from 3.5 to 7%. However, the number of females employed in the Defence Forces has made a modest increase from 6% to 7% during that time. We will continue to develop and implement targeted recruitment strategies aimed at increasing the number of women in the Defence Forces. Some of the initiatives include identifying measures to examine retention measures and identifying actual or perceived barriers to progression. More in detail, some of the other initiatives such as the family friendly policies. In addition, the, gender force, the Defence Forces is continuing to work towards the targets identified in the UN Gender Par Parity Strategy, whereby 15% women will be expected to be in contingent troops by 2028 a very ambitious target for sure that presents significant challenges. Within the Department of Defence, I, as Mari said, I'm the first female Secretary General of Defence in the history of the state. And my colleague, Claire Tiernan, is the first female member of the current management board. The department currently has 40% female representation at management board level, together with 40% female representation at principal officer or senior management level. It's a healthy situation and whilst good, we cannot be complacent. We need to do more to continue to provide opportunities and encourage females to apply for these higher level appointments and move seamlessly into decision making and leadership positions. Last month was designated Women, Peace and Security Month by the United Nations. So today I'd like to pay particular tribute to my colleague Brigadier General Maureen O'Brien and all of the 40 women of the Irish Defence Forces currently serving overseas across all overseas missions. My female colleagues in both the Department of Defence and the Defence Forces continue to break down barriers and in our own areas deliver first-class public service and represent our country with distinction on the international stage. As Ireland prepares to take our seat as an elected member of the UN Security Council in January 2021, we will work to ensure that we highlight, highlight the role of women peace builders. Minister Simon Coveney reminded us in October in a speech that Ireland is firmly committed to advancing women's inclusion in all aspects of peace and security. Notwithstanding these commitments and plans, the world we live in, including our own country, presents significant challenges for females, and I'd like to reflect on a few thoughts. It is widely acknowledged that at times of conflict, women and girls are disproportionately affected through rape and violence. In Ireland and globally, evidence suggests that incidents of domestic abuse have risen since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March this year. Despite better educational outcomes by women, they do not continue on this trajectory as time moves on and significantly occupy less influential positions than our male counterparts, who remain the principal decision makers in Irish society. This lack of female voices in decision making and leadership positions means that female experiences are excluded from policies and strategies. Mary Robinson, our, our previous Irish president and United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights said, it's only when you have a critical mass of women in politics that you get women's issues attacked. We need to ensure that, that critical mass is developed in all aspects of work. A recent McKinsey report found an irrefutable correlation between gender diversity and greater profitability. We need to move from a situation where gender quotas are deemed necessary or appropriate. Whilst huge progress has been made during my working life to change ingrained practices and attitudes in society, which collectively held back women and girls from achieving their true potential, more needs to be done. However, the landscape is changing. I do believe we have an expanding cohort of leaders, both male and female, who recognise the value of gender equality and its necessity in terms of accessing the most talented workforce you can have. We are getting to a point where it is recognised that gains for women lead to increased opportunities for greater economic prosperity for all and are not just seen as lost opportunities for men. So moving on then to how did I get here? I started work back in the day in 1982, having completed a secretarial course and got my first job in a leading Irish bank. In 1985, where little or no opportunities in Irish banking due to the severe economic recession, I asked for a transfer and moved to London, bringing with me two suitcases. 
15 years later, I returned to Ireland on a return transfer with a husband, two children and a truck full of stuff. I worked in branches dealing face-to-face -face with customers daily, in head office positions and generally moved to new roles or took on change responsibilities every three to five years. I gained both frontline and leadership experience and filled a number of senior roles both in London and Dublin. In 2013, as Ireland was returning to growth, I requested a salary increase, as I had evidence that other male colleagues had received saying. This regrettably was refused. In my anger, I decided that after 31 years, I needed to move, and hence, I went searching. I applied for and was successful in being appointed to the position of Deputy Financial Services Ombudsman. This was a huge, huge decision for me, to leave an organisation that I had worked with for 31 years, to leave a culture I knew, to go on probation at a lower income and to become an outsider instead of a lifer. The bank did then offer me a salary increase, but my husband encouraged me to go with my heart. So off I went then on this journey into public and civil service. In 2015, I applied for and got the position of Director General in the Office of the Ombudsman dealing with public services. As I transitioned from corporate to public services, relationships became very important. I have always placed huge emphasis on engagement with everyone involved from bottom to top, internal and external. This approach has stood me very well in all of the positions I have held. The importance of a leader having a supportive team cannot be underestimated. I got itchy feet again in 2018 when I spotted a position as Deputy Secretary in the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection. And once again, I lurched into the rigours of the top level appointments committee process. This was the position I held until August this year. What a time to work in this department. This year required myself, the Secretary General there and all of the management team to dig the deepest we have ever done in our working lives to deliver and support excellent public service. As a management team, we had to use our innovative skills against the clock to develop the pandemic unemployment payment and then deliver that to an unprecedented number of customers in the history of the department. This together with the challenge of keeping our offices open to serve our most vulnerable customers when the bogeyman of COVID-19 was very scary and everyone else was retreating back to home was enormous. But I salute the DESP team for a first class job and wish them well as they continue to do so. To get back to the story, in the middle of this, my current position as Secretary General of Defence was advertised. I have to credit my boss, John McKeown, with pushing me to consider it. He swore he wasn't trying to get rid of me. But seriously, without this nudge, I would not be here today. And thank you, John, for that. Last weekend, I was walking on the rocks in Rush, County Dublin, with my sister Angela and brother Michael, reliving our youth and remembering my first job as a winkle picker. In our youth, it is very hard to imagine where you might end up or how you will get there. I have worked since I was 18 years of age with 12 weeks and 14 weeks maternity leave for both my children, Cameron and Freya. That was all that was allowed at the time. I've had postnatal depression twice and for my 50th birthday, I developed late onset type one diabetes, resulting in my current five injections of insulin daily. Am I superwoman? Most certainly not. Making changes and dealing with life's challenges is not easy. It requires effort, energy, drive and tenacity to get there. You need your support team, you will cry, at times you will be on your knees, you will meet resistance, you will think of chucking it in, but the next day you dust yourself off and start again. I credit myself with the tenacity and determination to be the best I could, but I didn't get to here on my own. Enormous credit has to go to my husband, Morris, who has provided me with unswerving support and pushed me to achieve my ambitions, in particular that first major move in 2013, and all those other moves over the last number of years. I also credit all of my bosses, my family and friends for their support also. It is funny to think that I started my working career with the title of secretary in the bank. And hopefully if I pass my probation this year, I will progress towards the latter of my career with the same title, but at a different level. Confidence is a huge challenge to making those changes and having the ability to believe in yourself. You need to have your key supporters around, whether that be family, friends or colleagues, to give you the nudge and keep you upright. I am so lucky to have had that. So two references that I would like to make in summary. One is to the fearless girl statue in New York, which is that of a bronze girl who stands with her hands on her hips and chin held high. She is seen as a symbol of female empowerment and at her feet there is a plaque that reads, know the power of women in leadership, she makes a difference. She stands as a beacon showing women, young and old, that no dream is too big and no ceiling is too high. The other reference is to Kamala Harris, the first vice president elect in the United States of America. In her victory speech last week, she spoke of possibilities, sending a powerful message of hope and courage to women and young girls worldwide. 
As she said, while I may the, be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. And I think Maureen, Sonia and I connect with those words today. In summary, I am hugely privileged and proud to hold this position as Secretary General of the Department of Defence. I take the responsibility and its impact in all aspects of policy operations and support of colleagues of all gender. In my term in this office, I'm committing to make a difference by leading and delivering on our objectives in the defence organisation. So I'll leave you now with a quote from Winnie the Pooh and Piglet, maybe not a normal one for a business event, but one which has resonance with me. Promise me you will always remember you're braver than you believe and stronger than you seem and smarter than you think. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jackie. That was really inspirational and uh, something we will certainly take away and remember. Could I hand the floor now to um, Sonia Highland? And just to introduce Sonia, Sonia is the first woman to serve as political director in the Department of Foreign Affairs. She has also served as Ireland's ambassador to Ethiopia, accredited also to South Sudan, Djibouti and the African Union, and as Ireland's ambassador to Mexico, where she also had responsibility for Cuba, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Venezuela, Colombia and Peru. And Sonia is at the moment leading our team at headquarters uh, as we prepare to take up our seat on the UN Security Council for two year period 2021. The floor is yours, Sonia, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, um, Mary. And the Brigadier General and, and the Secretary General um, have already spoke in some detail on the Women, Peace and Security agenda, particularly as it affects the Defence Forces on Ireland uh, and peacekeeping more broadly, and have also given really fascinating insights into their own uh, experiences as women in leadership. So I'll try and keep my intervention short to maximise the time for, for Q&A. Maybe just really two reflections on the Women, Peace and Security agenda, particularly as it applies to diplomacy, uh, and two reflections on the issue of women in leadership. Um, first, as Jackie already said, there is very strong research evidence, including from McKinsey, but also from the World Economic Forum and others, that businesses with more diverse boards and senior management do better in commercial terms. And the research suggests that this is for two reasons. And again, um, both Brigadier General and the SecGen have, have mentioned this. First, because a higher proportion of women in senior positions indicates that the company is better overall at utilizing the broadest talent base possible. And second, because diversity in and of itself results in more rigorous decision making. It's much easier to combat groupthink and outdated assumptions if the group in question is made up of individuals with diverse perspectives and experiences. In the peace and security and in the diplomacy field, the outcome we're looking for is not commercial success. It's to contribute to securing national security and global security. The New York-based Council on Foreign Relations issued a paper last week about revitalizing the US State Department, in which the authors argued pretty persuasively in my view, that diversity needs to be seen as a national security priority. In the US, the senior foreign service is 90% white and 69% male. In the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, we don't track ethnicity, but the percentage of women at head of mission level is 33%, and at the most senior grades, which is assistant secretary and upwards, is less than 30%. The Civil Service Management Board has just four women at Secretary General level out of 23. When I joined the department in 1996, the gender ratio at third secretary level, which is the entry grade for diplomats, was roughly 55% male and 45% female. And the fact that those percentages are not coming through 24 years later at senior management level suggests that despite significant improvements, we haven't yet built a culture that recognizes and promotes talented people in a gender cognizant way. Second point on women, peace and security is that it's not a woman's agenda, it's an agenda for everyone. Yet every panel I've ever participated on to discuss women, peace and security has either been composed solely of women or mainly of women. My personal belief is that as long as the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 is seen as a sort of a side issue that lives in a female thematic bubble of its own, it'll never deliver on its promise. Like the Brigadier General, I'm not a gender essentialist. The reason that we need more women in the peace and security arena is not because women are innately more cooperative, more empathetic, more patient or less aggressive. And I know there's a number of colleagues uh, uh, online today who've worked with me and I think they would probably say I'm the most impatient person possibly in the world, but certainly in the department. So maybe that's why I, I'm not a gender essentialist. But we already do have evidence that most that more diverse organizations are more innovative and more effective 
And we also know that the percentages globally of women in militaries, in peacekeeping, in peace negotiations, and in diplomacy at a senior level are absolutely tiny. My own experience of always being in a minority in diplomacy, in gender terms, and particularly as a senior diplomat, and that's also particularly when I've worked on security and defense issues, suggests to me that the experience of being an outsider can be utilized to inform a more rigorous and a more interrogated foreign policy. Understanding and experience how unconscious bias often leads to outcomes that disadvantage women and other groups that are excluded from political and economic power is a pretty good basis, I think, not only for an ethical foreign policy, but also for an intelligent and an effective one. So unless someone can show me persuasive research evidence that white men between 50 and 65 are uniquely genet genetically skilled at decision-making in peace and security issues, I think there's a really strong case to be made that the underrepresentation of women in the security and defense field represents a significant and an unnecessary risk to good policymaking and diplomatic practice. And it's not female leaders that are responsible for changing this, it's all leaders. Two points on women in leadership. First, we need to look at structures. And second, we need to look at culture and attitudes. On structures, the statistics I quoted earlier, where we see similar percentages of women and men starting a diplomatic career, but the pipeline narrowing in the more senior ranks speaks to the need to get the structures right. The Irish Civil Service does have the huge advantage of what Sheryl Sandberg used to call on ramps and off ramps. We offer career breaks, flexible working, parental leave, and other family friendly, or more accurately, human friendly options. But we also need to embed a culture where balancing family and work life isn't seen as a permanent decision to jump onto the mammy track, or indeed the daddy track, and stay there forever. In a 45 year career, a couple of years out, or spending time working part-time or flexibly need not brand us as less committed, engaged, or ambitious than those who work in a more traditional pattern. And I know that in my own case, availing of parental leave to work a four-day week when my children were younger was instrumental in maintaining some level of balance between family and professional commitments at a particular time period. And these options in the civil service and in the public service in general should give us a huge advantage in terms of attracting and re recruiting talent male and female. Culture and attitudes matter too. Many women in senior positions are familiar with the experience of being the only woman at a meeting or attending events and listening to manal after manal after manal. One of the more memorable examples in my own career was sitting in the audience at the annual conference of one of the main business organizations of a country that I was accredited to. It was attended by many of the most senior people in government, including the head of government of the country concerned. The opening ceremony involved 32 senior national and regional government officials and the CEOs of companies sponsoring the events. All up on the stage, all were men. There was one woman on the stage whose job it was to bring the scissors with which the ribbon was cut. And outside there was an expo style area in which the companies attending had their stands where numerous women were advertising a large meat company by wearing extremely short red dresses with cut out panels just above their cleavage with the slogan, your meat written on them. Now that happened to be the name of the company, but it didn't take a genius to get the double entendre. I'm pretty thick skinned, but it can be hard not to feel alienated and excluded in that type of environment. Although that type of experience is probably rare enough in Ireland, we still need to look out for more subtle forms of discrimination. One of the things that I've noticed in recent years as we get nearer to gender parity and senior leadership is the view that female officers who've just been moved into prestigious jobs, for instance, only got them because they were a woman, or that for instance, in the civil service promotion panels with equal number of both genders only come about because the interview board was told that they had to put 50% women on the panel. And I think there's something very insidious about the idea that anything other than a small number of women in senior decision-making positions must be a sign of tokenism rather than evidence that organizations are getting better at removing barriers to women's advancement and identifying talent. And I'm sometimes reminded of the headlines in the UK in, in 2017, when the then Prime Minister Theresa May undertook a cabinet reshuffle. The Daily Mail and the Times ran respectively with massacre of the middle-aged men and white men booted out in May's push for women and ethnic minorities. And this was based on a reshuffle during which the percentage of men in government went from 75% to 70. The number of white government members reduced from 113 to 111 and the average age plummeted from 52 to 51. Uh, as the Guardian columnist uh, wrote afterwards, as massacres go, this was one with a curiously high number of survivors. 
finally, I just want to go back to a point that I made earlier. The Women, Peace and Security agenda is not only for women. I'd really like to hear more from male champions of this agenda, and I would really urge organizations to look to some of their senior men to lead on this. This is certainly something that we want to try and do during our Security Council term. Female leaders don't have sole responsibility for gender equality. We absolutely need to look at lack of diversity at senior level from the perspective of organizational effectiveness, of risk, and I think, as the paper from the Council on Foreign Relations argues, as a national security priority. The global peace and security challenges facing us are far too urgent and far too grave to leave this on the long finger any longer. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sonia, for that uh, pretty powerful speech. And uh, that was uh, really resonates. So we will move now to the Q&A, but before we open it to the floor, uh, we have a, a particular guest that I would like to give uh, uh, the uh, opportunity to pose the first question, and that is um, Nora Owen. Nora is joining us today, uh, who is uh, uh, certainly one of the trailblazers. Uh, good afternoon, Nora, and I know uh, uh, you have a question, but uh, Nora, yes. just to introduce, is former Minister for Justice and is at present chair of the Oversight Group for Ireland's uh, Women, Peace and Security Action Plan. So you're very welcome, Nora, but I know you have a question to pose to the panel, <laughs> so the floor is yours. Th thank you very much indeed, Mary, and may I start by thanking the, the wonderful speeches just we've just heard from, from, from Maureen and Sonia and Jackie. And thank you for, at times, um, bringing in a little bit of humour in order to get across a point, because I think that's very important. And I had great empathy with, with a, what a lot was said after 25 years in elected politics. Now, some of you will have already touched on this, but just given the importance of having women peacekeepers in missions, particularly in conflict areas, and perhaps uh, having to deal with the serious gender violence that goes on in camps, etc. What policies need to be implemented to encourage and just as importantly to maintain women in the defence forces to ensure that we do get that balance that all three of you have spoken about? Because I understand the figures are going up, but very slowly. And perhaps Maureen might tell us what other policies need to be implemented as well as the other two speakers. Thank you very much. So if I could hand the floor to you, Brigadier uh, General O'Brien, to, to take Nora's question first. Morning, could you unmute? Sorry, so I believe there are two parts to that question, Nora, sorry. Um, the first part is about um, the gender violence, gender-based violence side. Um, the third action plan for the Defence Forces outlines our plans to conduct additional training for, for military police, and we're going to extend that to, to uh, medical personnel for training in, in, in that area. Um, it's highly specialised um, in terms of then getting more women to into the defence forces. First of all, I, I'm, I wouldn't believe that most females would join to do that work first. They would join to be soldiers. And I suppose in common with trying to get more people into the defence forces in general, it is difficult in this climate and you'd be aware of the, the, the issues that are there regarding pay, etc. So I'd be surprised if females wanted to join the army more than men wanted to join the army in that case. But we have ideas about targeting women in particular. Um, so like going back to the fact that there are the um, career guidance teachers rarely present um, to the defense forces as being a, a good uh, job for, uh, for females. They just don't think about it. I think we have to educate the, uh, those, those people first, but also parents. And um, well, mostly it has to be said, the mammies who think that being in the defense forces is not a suitable place for, for, for their, their daughter. So I think we're doing our best in, in that and identifying that it is a place for females. And if you want to progress either um, professionally, but also in education as well, that we have additional uh, education um, uh, pro progress for, for women and men who want to join the Defence Forces. So all in all, it is a good job. And, and I think we have to uh, work with women in particular, maybe work with sports clubs, etc., like that, because we need people who are active in particular. I hope that answers your question, Nora. 
Thank you, Brigitte. No, uh, Mary, I don't think you're... Mary, you're on mute now. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, that's the most overused, uh, you're on mute, <laughs> I think, is the most overused phrase these days. Um, I, I wonder if um, Secretary General Macron, Jackie, do you want to add anything? Yes, I mean, um, I, I have to say that, um, you know, in, in researching for this now, I have to admit that I'm, I'm on week 13 now in the job. So um, and Maureen has been very helpful in giving me some details and, and my other colleagues. But, um, you know, the, the percentage um, uh, the number of females employed in the defence forces has, has really only the, the diet has only turned very slowly in the last nine years, um, like from six percent to seven percent. And that's not without um, the ambition there to, to grow that and I think we need to do some further research um, you know and, and the, you know the various uh, you know family friendly policies uh, the barriers have been looked at and, and various other things have been done but we need to do more and um, because it is a good job um, and you know in terms of the support that you're given and um, you know the education that you're given um, you know it, it is it is very rewarding and um, again to hear the voice of somebody like Maureen who um, has been a, who is a leader and um, you know to encourage people to do that and um, I think you're right Maureen I was talking I, I talked to one of the officers who was heading off and I went up to Dundalk um, when the troops were heading off there a few weeks ago and one of the um, uh, female members had said to me that you know her family had actively dissuaded her from joining the army for a number of years so she had gone to university she had gone into a marketing degree had worked in that industry for a number of years and then she just went back to what she wanted to do anyway which was join the army and now she was heading off on her first overseas mission so i look forward to welcoming her back and and seeing what has been her experience and hopefully it's been all good but um you know the the minister the chief of staff and myself are very determined to, to move this dial and we, with the help of maureen and and other colleagues that's what we intend to do so um, we would be putting our best foot forward and hopefully if we're here in another year or two, we might um, have a different story. Yes. Thank you. I Mary, you're on mute again. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this isn't working very well. So Sonia, do you want to add anything to that? I want to add anything to that because it's very specific, I think, to the Defence Forces. So I'll come in on other issues. Thank you. OK, OK. I. Um, I've had a similar question also from uh, retired Brigadier General Peter O'Hanlon, and I think I, I hope that, that that has been answered. Uh, a couple, we have several more questions here today, and uh, I have one here from the Norwegian Ambassador to Ireland, uh, who um, thanks you all for your leadership and presentations. And Ireland and Norway will uh, soon join the Security Council together, having both been successful in this competition. And um, Ambassador uh, Skaris says, uh, we need to close the gap between the UN Security Council Women, Peace and Security policies and its implementation. How can we ensure that the actors with specific responsibilities for implementation of uh, Women, Peace and Security priorities are being held accountable? Sonia, you might like to deal with that one. Thanks, um, Mary. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think it's key that we don't just have Women, Peace, Security over in a corner uh, and look at it, take it out and look at it every October, which is Women, Peace and Security Month, and have thematic debates and then put it back in the box until the following October. I mean, I think one specific way in terms of the UN Security Council is to make sure that the Women, Peace, Security agenda is properly implemented and mainstreamed into, for instance, uh, the mandates of peacekeeping missions and also the mandates of special UN special political missions. So all of the UN peacekeeping operations are mandated by the UN Security Council and all of the special political missions, so the Secretary General's special envoys, for instance, or special representatives of the Secretary General, those mandates are also approved by the Security Council. So for Ireland, it's really a once in a generation opportunity for us to actually be at the Council table uh, and be part of the approval process, the negotiation and the approval process of those mandates. And I think this to me is one of the ways that we can really make sure that there's proper implementation and hold, uh, hold leaders to account by making sure that the Women, Peace and Security agenda is properly implemented into peacekeeping mandates and properly implemented into the mandates or the terms of reference for all of the UN Secretary General's special envoys uh, and special representatives who are managing political missions across the world. 
there's also an uh, uh, expert working group um, under the sec under the uh, UN Security Council, which deals with women, peace and security issues. And one of the things that we would like to see and contribute to is make sure that that uh, working group, again, is calling, is holding to account, is calling um, the heads of peacekeeping missions, the heads of uh, special political missions into that group to talk about how they are implementing and the extent to which they're implementing the women, peace and security part of their mandate and to make sure that that's done four, six, eight weeks out before the mandate is renewed so that we get proper um, in-time information and intelligence and are able to hold to account the people who are leading the missions uh, and judge the extent to which they are uh, adequately implementing it, but also the extent to which their mandate gives them uh, the mandate to do so and whether the language in the mandate and the tasking in the mandate is correct in terms of what women peace security agenda elements have to be implemented. So that when we go to negotiate the mandate or to be part of the negotiations for the mandate, we've heard directly from uh, the leaders in the field as to whether those mandates are sufficient and also whether they're implementing those mandates. So I think that's one of the core ideas that we want to take to the Council on this. Thank you very much indeed, Sonia. I have another question here from, uh, I think, a former colleague of uh, Brigadier General Brian Starry Fitzgerald, and that he would like to congratulate uh, Brigadier General Maureen for her achievements on the Golan Heights. And he says, has gender engagement been challenging when you face different nationalities and different cultures within the UN force, the local population and the military forces involved? What would you like to see improve most of all? Um, thank you, and thank you to uh, the, the question. Um, I have found actually that um, engagement, uh, when I came over here first, you know, I was thinking I'm going to have to engage with the senior Brigadier General in the Syrian Armed Forces and also a senior Brigadier General in the Israeli Forces. And I wondered about how that would work, um, especially in the Syrian Force. But I have to say, I've been accepted because of the appointment I hold and the rank I hold. And also when they figure out that you're not just a token woman, that you actually are the person who's doing the job. I think they're, they're very conscious that they have to work together. They also have to work because I, uh, they have to work with me because ultimately I write reports to UN headquarters that are then part of the Secretary General's reports. So it is important that we have a connection between each other. So in terms of different cultures, um, I haven't had a problem with it. I'm very conscious, of course, in this mission because we have nine different nationalities, um, all with different cultures. I have found that, and, and particularly only a few weeks ago, I said something that I thought was funny, but rather one person did not appreciate it. So I obviously, first thing, apologize, the, the art of apology, apologize fully for what, uh, what I had said, not understanding. Um, what he had, uh, what he had taken from it. So I think those are important. But can, but interestingly, we do do uh, cultural awareness courses um, in the UN school um, in the Cora, which is also quite helpful. Um, you know what the gender norms are, and you don't necessarily have to fight against it. You have to understand it. Interestingly, I did have to visit the um, the um, ambassador of Iran. Um, to ask him to stop, essentially stop fighting and stop bringing his um, personnel over into Syria. Um, but the gender norm there was there was that I had to wear a scarf over my head and I did that because I was making the journey to his um, to his office and it was actually a representative of Iran and it was a piece of Iran I was visiting. So um, I think you have to be culture aware but I haven't had any difficulties and I think that's down to the rank and being taken seriously in my appointment. Thank you indeed. Um, I have another question here from Catherine Wright of Newcastle University. And she said, how do we better challenge the essentializing idea, which as Brigadier General points, O'Brien points out, underpins much uh, women, peace and security discourse while also calling for women's better inclusion in the WPS agenda. So uh, Jackie, perhaps you might, you might deal with this. Um, the, how do you actually, bring the women, peace and security uh, discourse uh, into a more open area, which would allow for women uh, to uh, be more involved in that area. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, apologies. Um, I think that uh, Sonia um, has covered off quite a lot of, of what our ambitions are. We're, we're very um, privileged and delighted to um, accept this seat uh, on the UN Security Council. And I think that would be our, our area where we can highlight the work of women peace builders and certainly um, you know, commit to advancing that inclusion um, in all aspects of peace and security. So, um, you know, from our perspective as a, as a department, we are working significantly with uh, the department that, uh, of foreign affairs, which is uh, the one that Sonia is in. We have, we actually share a minister, which is unusual um, in that for the first time ever, we share a minister um, in both of the departments. But I think that uh, will serve actually to, um, you know, to develop a cohesive approach and a strategy towards, uh, uh, imp you know, improving the discourse uh, on this very important subject. Thank you very much indeed, Jackie. I have a question also now from the um, uh, Ambassador Adrian Palm, uh, the Ambassador of the Netherlands. And he makes an interesting point, uh, which I think um, uh, other Sonia uh, or Brigadier General O'Brien could deal with. He said that the situation of uh, women in peace and security is improving in the EU, uh, but elsewhere in the world we hardly see any progress. And not only as far as boots on the ground are concerned, but also, for example, in peace negotiations. So we asked, what can we do to improve that? And are there best practices we can put forward towards countries involved in conflict? Um, perhaps Brigadier General O'Brien, and then maybe Jackie, or maybe uh, Sonia, you have um, uh, could add to that. Brigadier O'Brien. Um, Mary, uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't have much experience in peace negotiations uh, in, in that regard. Sorry, I don't know enough about that to, to have an opinion, I'm afraid. Right, okay, well, Sonia, do you have any, um, any point of view to put forward on, on why women elsewhere uh, are not doing so well? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the ambassador's question, um, which as I understand it is sort of how can we support or how can we, how can we uh, facilitate uh, women in, uh, elsewhere in the world uh, to engage on the women's security agenda. I mean, I think the first thing is I'm not 100% sure that I agree um, that, you know, in the EU we're, we're doing well and outside we're not. I mean, I think there are really good examples of, for instance, in Colombia, the Colombian peace process, there was very strong um, participation of women throughout the negotiations, both on the Colombian government side and on the FARC side. And actually it was the first peace process in the world and the first peace negotiation in the world and the first, first, first peace agreement in the world that had uh, what was called a gender table or a subgroup on gender from the very, very beginning. Um, and actually, if you read the Colombian peace agreement, it's incredibly well suffused through with a gender lens, uh, as well also as a lens on uh, issues like ethnicity uh, as well, which is a huge issue in the, in the Colombian conflict. Um, also in terms of things like decision making, if you look at a country, for instance, like Rwanda, uh, it has extremely high um, numbers and percentages of women in decision making, uh, particularly in diplomacy and particularly in some of the, the tougher and the more uh, peace and security aspects of, of diplomacy. Um, so I think it's I think it's more nuanced than, than just saying Europe's doing well, everyone else is not doing well. I mean, I think having said that, one of the things that we uh, have done a lot in Ireland, and I've been involved in it directly myself in, in Colombia and in Ethiopia, um, is bring our experience of women in peace building and women in peace negotiations in particular uh, from Northern Ireland uh, or from the island of Ireland uh, and share those experiences. So for instance, we brought a variety of uh, women who were involved in the negotiation of the Good Friday Agreement, but also various stages of the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, particularly around security sector reform and policing to Colombia. Uh, and had a fantastic uh, couple of days, uh, them meeting across civil society, government, um, police, defense forces in Colombia to share the experience and what we'd learned and what worked and what didn't work. We did the same, Monica McWilliams came to Ethiopia, we did the same in Ethiopia um, with both specifically in the Somali region um, where we had um, a situation where two groups which had formerly been terrorist groups, the ONLF and another smaller group had just been brought back from Eritrea into, this, into the Somali region. And there were real difficulties around the DDR process and around reintegration in particular uh, of, of, of combatants, um, but also more broadly in Ethiopia. And she spent uh, a number of days, again, speaking with the Ethiopian government, speaking with NGOs, speaking with Somali regional government, meeting with the ONLF, which was the, uh, 
the movement uh, in question to talk about her experiences and the experiences of, of, of women in Northern Ireland. And I think that's one of the things that we really want to try and do on the Security Council also, is to take into the council our own learn our own lived experience um, in Ireland, and particularly the fact that it's not it's not simple, it's not a linear process, it's not a straightforward process, it has ups and downs, um, it's very context specific, but at the same time there are universal lessons that can be learned from it. Um, so I would say that that's probably one of the ways that we can most usefully uh, engage. But again, I think there's cross learning here, I don't think it's only Europe out to the rest of the world. Thank you very much indeed, Sonia. I have a question here from Ruth Beeney, uh, who is the Civil and Political Affairs Officer in the UN Mission in South Sudan, uh, coming, coming to us a long way. Uh, and she puts a, a difficult question. How do you build relationships and generate an atmosphere of accountability when violations take place? Um, that is a tough one. I don't know, um, Brigitte General O'Brien, do you have a, a view on that? Because you're out in the field and uh, you will no doubt have observed uh, difficulties in this regard. Yeah, um, my experience has been that when there are serious violations, uh, in particular um, ones that put my troops at risk in terms of security, um, I do a one-on-one, -on -one, I meet the particular uh, general and I explain to them what they are doing and, and they give me another explanation why they are doing what they are doing. And I, I point out to both sides when they're making excuses, you did that, so we did this, that they both have obligations according to the agreement, whether which the other side complies or not. Um, and it, it, I think it does, um, this discussion certainly um, helps in, 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 in the decisions that they make subsequently, whether or not to make similar attacks or do similar, um, have similar kinetic activity. Uh, I think they think twice, but not always, because in certain, in one of the parties that are involved, the decision to do, um, to attack or to, to uh, or something like that is made at a very low level, not at a high level. Uh, that's just the ways that the troops in, in this particular case are organized. But generally I find continuing to talk about the effect and their responsibilities and they understand that I bring this forward again. Um, unfortunately, um, UNDOF doesn't have a political pillar. So it's my responsibility to bring these to the attention of the of UN headquarters. And also I uh, on a twice a year we um, we talk to all the ambassadors involved. So they're aware, they're aware of what's going on and can bring this to the attention and work with the parties in UN headquarters as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Martin. I have another question here um, uh, um, on uh, the question of training. And I want to put this to, to um, Jackie, Secretary General Jackie. We have a training, uh, peacekeeping training school in, in the Cara, uh, Jackie. Do you feel that there's an opening there that we could uh, have a, a cadre of women from uh, other countries, which we do have in, in that school? That we could train women peacekeepers in. Uh, is there is there a opening for that kind of training? Um, I uh, thank you, Mary. I think there are. Um, we do have significant ambitions for that uh, school, and um, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, I I haven't. I, I got down to the Curra once to talk to staff and command uh, course just once in the last uh, twelve or thirteen weeks, but I haven't. Uh, explored all of it but certainly there is a wonderful wonderful resource there and um, it's only um, hampered by our uh, ability to just get to get to that point and, and to deliver it but um, I do think that there is a huge option for us to utilize that resource in a more effective way and perhaps um, you know certainly during this time when we um, can't be, be sharing and, and, and meeting as, as, as often as we should do that it's probably a time that we will we will look to to plan and operationalize that but um, no, I do agree. It's a great resource, and you know the defence forces are always very keen uh, to share their um, experiences, their learning, and um, uh, you know uh, showcase to to um, people that would like to use it. Thank you very much indeed. I think it really has a, is a potential resource for the future. Yeah. 
Um, Can I come in there just very briefly, Mary, just because um, it's something that in recent, just in the last two or three years, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of Defence and the Defence Forces have worked together actually on this a little bit. Um, we've provided some funding for um, for troops from various different countries all around the world, a lot of, particularly from African uh, partners, to come to do the training at, at UNSI. Some around women, peace and security, some around a whole range of other issues, protection of civilians, um, and a whole range of other issues that, that are absolutely key for peacekeeping, but don't necessarily get integrated into training modules in other parts of the world, but which we're, I think, particularly good at. Um, so hopefully, hopefully uh, we can, uh, as Jackie said, continue to work on that, because I think it's, it's something for both departments actually to, to focus on, and it's an incredibly valuable tool, and an incredibly valuable tool to share with militaries from across the world. Yes, I think so, and that has been the case uh, that you had quite a number of military. So I'm afraid time is moving on. We still have a lot of questions, but I have just time for one more, and it's it's uh, it's quite a provocative one. It's from Ethan Yarul, and it's as uh, it's just saying there is a growing trend towards a feminist foreign policy, including in a number of arms exporting states. Um, uh, in Europe, I presume Eva is, is referring to, and should Ireland adopt a feminist foreign policy? Um, I'll give you that, Sonia, as well, to wrap up. Thank you. Um, good question. I mean, I think certainly we sh we do have already, but we can certainly improve on, and we should be we are improving on, but we should be improving on quick more quickly. Uh, a, a foreign policy, I think, that takes a gender lens, um, mainly in the development sphere, but as Helena mentioned, for instance, in the disarmament sphere, Helena herself as disarmament director did really extraordinary work on that. Um, and in the peace and security sphere, we've got a, got a strong focus on women, peace and security. Um, so I think across most of our foreign policy priorities, we have integrated gender and gender issues pretty well. I suppose what I don't know is what's the difference between that and a feminist foreign policy. Um, and that's, you know, that's not trying to avoid the question. It's actually a genuine, a genuine issue. One thing I would say is that we had uh, just recently we have done what we call the foreign policy startup. And basically anybody from the department at any level, locally employed staff or, or core staff of the department uh, employed by HQ, were allowed to put in a, uh, ideas for a new innovative ideas around foreign policy. Um, the one that was chosen had nothing to do with gender, but the one that came runner up was should Ireland uh, adopt a feminist foreign policy. Oh, and the first we put that in, um, we decided that although it, did, it didn't actually win the competition, we were going to try and work uh, with the colleague who put that in to try and work through what might that mean uh, and what might that look like. Um, she's currently, ironically, in a posting which is uh, in the middle of a particularly uh, egregious, awful uh, peace and security issue at the moment, uh, mid-conflict, so she's probably focusing on that at the moment rather than the feminist foreign policy part, but uh, hopefully in the, next, in the next couple of months we'll be able to work with her to work through what that might look like. Yeah. That's very interesting that uh, there's a coalescence of ideas there. I think it probably arose at the speaker we had a few months ago, the Swedish foreign minister. I think they have uh, specifically adopted a Swedish uh, a feminist foreign policy. So that may be uh, the generation of the idea. I'm afraid time has run out. I must apologize to all those people who didn't, whose questions I didn't get around to. There were some interesting ones. But could I take the chance to thank you, the panelists in particular, most sincerely, Brigadier General Maureen O'Brien and Secretary General Jackie McCrom and Sonia Highland. Um, and also particular thanks to Helena Nolan who generated the idea. But we wish you all well, and Maureen, in the Golan Heights and um, uh, Jackie in uh, starting off on this new uh, adventure. Um, you've had plenty so far, so I'm sure this will be uh, uh, as exciting as ever. And of course, Sonia, as you take on on the 1st of January, the Security Council Challenge. We wish you all well, and, and we thank you most sincerely for joining us today. I think it's been a very rich discussion, and we have already gained. Thank you all sincerely, and very best wishes. Thank you.